So I just want to share with you um, just the handout we'll be going over tonight. This is the this is the age of the spirit webinar. It's part of a finding flow webinar I do every every month, typically a free Zoom webinar, um, and it is in conjunction with the monthly or the we weekly simple wisdom reflections that I send out every Monday through through my email blog, basically. So glad to have you all join us. Um, looking forward to this topic. Um, I it, 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 and uh, we'll just see where the, the Holy Spirit leads us. So tonight, a couple things we're going to do is we'll first take a little bit of time for welcome and introduction. So we'll just introduce ourselves, um, where we're from, what our image of the divine, the Holy Spirit, the divine spirit is just maybe as we're kind of introducing ourselves to just, uh, you know, say for us, is there a word, a phrase, an image, a metaphor of who or what the the Holy Spirit or the Divine Spirit is to you. Then we'll do a little Lexio Divina of life to really center ourselves in, in God's Spirit uh, with us and allow us through our imagination to really feel what it might have been like at that first Pentecost um, that has continued since then. And then we're going to go through three questions and, and I'll give some background, but also hopefully we'll have some conversation around these questions. Um, and the first one is, is how has God over the ages chosen to reveal the divine image to humanity? And we'll, we'll uh, uh, rely upon a good Italian uh, monk, Joachim of Fioria, who um, in the 1100s wrote about um, his thesis um, about how he believes the Trinity is really the revelation of God to the ages. So we'll talk about that as background. And then we'll ask, is this the age of the spirit? Um, and have some conversation around that. Why or why not? And, and some history about that. And then really kind of what's the, if, if this is the age of the spirit, you know, we're invited to look to the signs of the times. Where is God's movement in, in, in the culture, in, in, our, in our society, within our own selves individually? How is the spirit, I like to say, what's the spirit up to basically? And particularly in, in my sense is, as we look to where the spirit is moving, my hope is that we will find hope because we've just gone through a pretty difficult time worldwide with the pandemic and everything else. And by focusing on, well, where is the spirit's movement and all of that? We really look with that third eye of wisdom to, to try to discern where God is leading and guiding us. And then we'll spend a closing time with how do you connect with the spirit? Kind of a smorgasbord of... Um, you know, what are your personal practices that because it's kind of like we can all learn from each other. What do you do on a regular basis or what do you hope to do or, or what would you learn like to learn more about. And I'll also offer offer just another pattern that I've uh, over the ages through my teachers have learned that I call finding flow um, that what I'm writing a book about that which is as, as another possible way of connecting with the spirit so does that makes sense. So how about we go around our virtual community here, and if you want to one by one, tell us your name, where you're from, and then, yeah, what's your image, a, a, a word, metaphor, what rises up with you when you today think of the Holy Spirit, the Divine Spirit, or whatever you choose to call the Divine. So let's go around our circle, and if people want to just one by one kind of just share what where, where you make, yeah, go for it. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Nella Keenan, and I'm in Port Kembla, Australia, on the East Coast, about 80 kilometres south of Sydney, a um, beautiful coastal town on the ocean, oh, wow. except we're in the beginning of winter, but it's not like winter in the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> um, and um, my metaphor for me, which popped up into my, my, my mind, was like yeast and dough like mm. i understand that too much yeast in the dough can overwhelm the dough mm. and i think the the yeast you only need a little bit of yeast to infect the whole dough mm. so some because part of i reflect this part of my journey is um um obviously the contact that you have not everyone understands on the same level mm -hmm. so i understand that if we're called to do our part so whatever part we're called to do yeah. it's one little part and then sometimes it can be overwhelming because it's like a struggle to to sometimes connect 
with people and you just they're not ready to hear it so I am my um, understanding is that it doesn't matter you do your part and you don't know the outcome of it you're just putting the the little bit of yeast in it and God grows the rest wow. so um, the, the yeast and dough is a good metaphor for me because um, you only need a few to infect a lot <laughs> Yeah, and have a great loaf of bread. Exactly. Wow. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, and, and I think looking back in history, you only just got to look. It's only, there's a there's the, the remnant that mm -hmm. sort of carries on the momentum. Mm -hmm. And and I suppose the same with make, you know, like a lake doesn't happen overnight. A lake happens with one drip at a time eroding mm -hmm. into uh, the earth. Mm -hmm. And then eventually there's enough water running through it that you get a lot of momentum. So I suppose the Holy Spirit works like that yeah. and you can see that in the, in the history of the world also um and what was the next part that we had to, to yeah. mention was it name where you're from and yeah what what's your image of the meta, uh, holy spirit that metaphor so yeah yeah I, I love that image that's great yeah i'm gonna tuck that away <laughs> who would like to share next I'll try. Thanks, Amy. I'm, I'm really interested in this because I haven't read a lot, but I have read somewhat about the idea of the age of the spirit and that every, every 500, approximately 500 years in Latinized, you know, like Christian communities, there is some type of major spiritual event uh, like the great schism mm -hmm. between Roman Catholicism and the Greek Orthodox Church. Mm -hmm. And then I was thinking about Martin Luther, who was that such a, uh, I'm searching for the word, he always wanted to do the right thing. And the, the word for that is escaping me at the moment. But then suddenly, as he read scripture, the words that jumped out at him were the just shall live by faith. Mm -hmm. And so we got the reformation. Yeah, yeah. And... So I was thinking about that and I was thinking, you know, way back at the time of Pentecost, how even before the disciples went out on missions, from that day of Pentecost, there were believers from many countries and nations there, according to scripture, and they left and went home. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, true. And so they were taking this, the spirit with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what I, I'm really curious about if, and it appears to be based in fact, that approximately every 500 or so years, there is some major revolution that is economic and it, it comes out of struggles that are going on in the world. Mm -hmm. And the, the people who are writing about this say that this is a movement of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, exactly. And so what I've read that this age is being called is the great emergence. Yep. That's what we're I don't know what that means, <laughs> but I was, I was thinking about um, Kenan, whatever your first name is. You're here. Yeah. Uh, metaphor of the yeast and the dough i mean i don't know what's baking out there but <laughs> something is really going on i believe it mm -hmm. um i hope it is the work of the spirit that is going to bring great change and wonderful things yeah into god's world yeah but right now it doesn't look like it as we'll talk about, you know, it, it, there's that co coexistence. Like, if, if this is the age of the spirit, the spirit's doing the spirit's part, 
and now we as as individuals have to learn how we want to be to, to name that and then connect with it which we'll talk about tonight so good deal good good questions and observations amy thank you yeah. oh and my um my metaphor for the spirit is presence presence okay. presence nice like that yeah thank you i yeah. say something yeah. <laughs> um um in regards to what Amy said too, is I think also if I base it on uh, like what happened to me is that even though I was a Christian by birthright and I hadn't been to church for many, many years, but I always had some sort of belief in, in God. Um, well, how I healed was through who I thought I was, which is the psychology of my identity. Well, if you want to put this in mental health, and I think this is the next this is the next understanding. It's the healing of who you think you are, the true self and the false self. Sure. Okay. Because there's two lives living simultaneously. Mm. We're born into this world. Obviously, our we're spiritual beings have a human experience. Right. So until we, we come to terms and things will happen in your life, which is called accidents, near misses, suffering, mm. they're all gifts. Just like what happened to me was a gift. Mm -hmm. And it was through my suffering that I found something much deeper in me, which is the soul life, yeah. which is using me in this life form sure. to bring out the spirit. Mm -hmm. So mental health is actually going to be a catalyst mm -hmm. for this next wave of spiritual awakening because they call it Christ consciousness, but it relates to all the religions. Yeah. You know, Christians can't just walk around and say, you've got to be saved by Christ. The whole, everything, the suffering with all the religions is this Christ consciousness opportunity to heal. When the two become one, you become whole and healed. And then this was my psychological experience. Yeah. So it's, I actually didn't read no books, nothing of this. I was involved with nothing except my suffering. Mm. And it was so profound that it'd be different if I read the books and was striving to get somewhere, mm. but I had the whole experience. Mm. Then later I found what actually happened to me to understand what happened to me because oh, cool yeah. so yeah. mental health, which is rife all over the world, which is also a sign that we have become so disconnected from our spirit because we're using our mind and our body. We're not actually connecting with that third most important part of who we are. Yeah. Perfect. A great yeah. observation. Yeah. So Mary Jane or Vicki or Nancy or Joy? Yep. Um, I can go right ahead. Um, so I'm Mary Jane. I'm in Pentwater, Michigan, right on the beautiful lake shore of Lake Michigan. Um, my, it's interesting because just the other day I was talking with someone and we were talking about God and, and what, how we name God or how we imagine God and what came up are the 99 names for God that are known in the Muslim Muslim uh, religion and I've I've looked at the those names over time but because of our conversation I just decided to look them up again and I had the list with me and I decided to take a walk yesterday as I often do here um in the evening and I had the the list and so I was just kind of praying those 99 names for God yeah. and finding Great which one, one really um, spoke to me and the one that throughout this day um, spoke simply was a, a, the name for God as peace and blessing mm. and um, so I I pray to peace and for peace, and through peace, and blessing, um, and but and so that's that's kind of the it's it for me. Um, you know, my image or my uh, the way I I speak of or even relate to the divine has changed over and over and over time. I mean, otherwise I think to stay static, yeah. we would not be growing. Yeah, exactly. But um, 
so that awareness of peace and blessing and it comes so clearly to me and through through my natural surroundings uh, i have in our off our back porch you know we we have the birds that i feed and we have the chip, little chipmunk there's always a little chipmunk chipster a little chippy there's the morning doves there's the rabbits um but there's the lake there's the there's a there's this huge tree that just reaches its limbs over the whole street right down the block from me mm. um which has told me its name as mother erica it's definitely mother erica mm. um but for me it, it it kind of relates to um richard Rohr's piece on the universal christ that um the christ is within all creation and so that image of the divine surrounding me and yes being presence and uh, you know just um being within me um imagining being loved um there's just there's just too many too many uh, ways for me to express yeah. what or who and how the divine is for me. There's just these 99 names. In fact, I this one person said, "Well, this is how why name." So I texted her back and I said, "These this is the I'm sending you the list of the 99 names for God. I'm sure your name could be the 100th." So there's, but there's so many ways that I think um, throughout my lifetime, I have imaged the divine um, yeah. and very real for me, I have come and gone, but for, very real for me truly is, is Jesus, um, Jesus, the Christ, but also the human Jesus. I have even said, I really, really, really want to see the face of Jesus the human Jesus, the historical Jesus, uh, one of these days. I really do want to meet Jesus face to face, who was the Jesus of history. Beautiful. Yeah. So yeah. thank you. Mary divinity Jean. is just so um, expansive. Yeah. And thank goodness. It's we, hard we, for me to put yeah. it in one word. Yeah. As James Finley uh, uh, often says is, the metaphors are the only ways we can point to God, and and they're they're helpful because they help us conceptualize it. But it's always bigger than that. And there's that sense of thank goodness because it's there's more and more and more that will never get to the end of it. And so I think you're exactly right. The minute we think we have it pinned down, it's not pinned down. But but there is that day to day, like you know, yesterday and today, the peace and blessing where we experience this is God communicating directly to you today for what you right. Do. And so those words and metaphors are, are helpful. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Mary Jane. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Nancy, we can see you now. <laughs> yeah. Hi there. Good to see you. Yeah. I'll, I'll go ahead and go next. I, um, I had, I was eating my dinner. <laughs> so <laughs> didn't want to eat in front of you all. Um, I, it, speaking of mental health, then that's absolutely true right now. I'm a psychotherapist, and mm. um, as soon as we're done here, I have a Zoom meeting with a, a client. So I was trying to get dinner while and do a couple of things at once here. <laughs> um, uh, my way of connecting with spirit i mean i've been i'm a long-term centering prayer person i have done that a long time and so much of the time in doing centering prayer i have a sense of presence um got god's presence through god's spirit um but this last year the image that has just really stayed with me and become an active prayer in my life is the spirit as the wind, um, the story of Nicodemus and Christ. And he talks about being born again. And he talks about that the wind blows where it will. And we don't know, and we can't see where it's coming from. And 
that image and that sense of we really aren't going to know completely what the spirit is up to, but the, the spirit, this wind is blowing. And in a year like we've had, I just, I started praying this probably about a year ago where I would just keep praying spirit blow. If there's blow all over the world, if there ever was a time we need the spirit, it feels like it's right now everywhere. And um, I was attracted to tune in to your talk today because I, I have read the writings of Phyllis Tickle. I've heard her speak. I want, I guess, to trust or believe that we are moving into the age of the spirit. I, I feel like we need that so much. We need the spirit working. And I, I, I do see glimmers and signs of consciousness changing in people and awareness. And certainly even in this last year, in the last four years, there's just been new awareness of the abuses people have lived through and experiences from women to races. Um, just There's just a lot that seems to be like Richard Rohr has been talking about this year as an unveiling. And I think that's true. A lot has been unveiled, um, yeah. but just really wanting to see the spirit just blow around the world and what a beautiful image and prayer yeah. for that yeah yeah and we'll talk about to, to this evening the rooting you know yeah how do we root ourselves in really trusting that this is the, the blowing of, of of the holy spirit so we'll talk about that thank you yeah. mm -hmm. nikki or joyce um i'm joyce from omaha nebraska and I don't know. I, I've just noticed that my life is, when I was little, I always used to think of God as, as Jesus, you know, because I could relate to the little child and whatever. And then as I got older, it was God, <laughs> you know, because he told me what to do. <laughs> it was like a father figure. Mm. And, you know, now that I'm older, I'm hopefully wiser. <laughs> Um, I guess I've always thought that there, not that there's a God for each stage in our life, but just that mm -hmm. that's kind of, because of the, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you know, they're, they're more, you almost have to live a while to, to have, you know, be even aware of them. Mm -hmm. And I guess my metaphor was, there was a movie called The Power of One, and this, the, imagery in that movie was just it started with one raindrop and it went to a full waterfall mm. and you know that's kind of like mm. i've been searching or trying to journey for it's kind of like well, what am i going to do when i grow up <laughs> <laughs> and you know i i have a feeling sometimes that i'm not that spiritual but then all of a sudden i'll say something and they go you know somebody will say I always thought of you as my spiritual director, and I go, "What?" <laughs> you know. <laughs> so that I don't think that's me talking. I think that's mm -hmm. the spirit through me, and I don't even realize it. And that's why you guys are so so much further advanced because, you know, I guess I don't know if it's because I've always been Catholic and always had somebody teaching religion to me that maybe I. I don't know that I actually ever had a turning point. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, just a, a process. Page. Right. I, don't I mean, it's a process, but it's more, it's always been there for me. And I guess I've been really lucky about yeah. that, you know? Sure, sure. That's great. Uh, well, it's good to see you, Joyce. Glad, glad you're here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Vicki, you want to share where you're from and what your image of the divine spirit is? Yes. I'm here in Kansas City, Missouri, in the middle of the nation. Um, I also had the image of spirit as wind because it's invisible, but you can see the effects mm -hmm. and sometimes feel it. Sometimes it blows gently and sometimes it's a hurricane, but. Oh. 
And the beauty of it is, is that it's that both and that everything that we, you know, say the spirit is, it is, and it's bigger than that. And so it's the beauty of it is to be open to, yeah, these are bits and pieces that I can use. And this is how we learn from each other. I mean, I believe the Holy Spirit is present in this virtual community as we just ponder that. And that's my prayer. Um, to me, again, I'm Brian Plakta from Grand Rapids. I'm a, um, some people would call it a recovering uh, attorney. <laughs> that was my my career for years, 38 years. And I'm, I discovered my gifts in age 30 when I took a spiritual gifts inventory um, of writing, teaching, and, and mentoring, and have slowly just loved learning, went on and got a master's in pastoral counseling, a spiritual director through Dominican Center that Mary Jane's uh, familiar with, which has just been an amazing, and, and, and Amy too, I think, um, amazing experience where I believe the good sisters and the teachers at Dominican Center help me understand who the spirit is and, and that it is to, to me today, I would call the spirit wisdom, um, the spirit, and it's really the Old Testament word that, and, and the word that Solomon prayed for. And, um, you know, wisdom being uh, for me, uh, just listening um, to that, that insight that comes, like Mary Jane talks about, when all of a sudden the, those words, the 99 names and peace and blessings jumps out, that listening, uh, John of the Cross talks about the, um, it, it, my wife calls it inspiration, that it just comes out of nowhere, like, yes, that is the spirit. It also comes from life experiences, and exactly as Joyce and Vicki were saying, you know, um, we always tease, we've got four children, and when they were younger, my wife's a school teacher, and she says, you know, the kids have half a brain. And I said, what, what do you mean? She said, well, they haven't had life experience. So the, part of their brain is not developed. Um, and as we grow, you know, we learn, like, when I touch a hot stove, I better take my finger off because it hurts. Or when I drink too much alcohol and it becomes a problem, I need to do so. You know, so that's a wisdom is also lived experience. But it's also, um, to me, also that sense of, of, of studying and, 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 and workshopping and learning, uh, reading and, and stuff like that. So to me, that's, that's my prayer to the Holy Spirit is just for the gift of wisdom. And, uh, but again, even that image or word is, is not large enough to contain the Spirit, but it's, but it's what I pray for um, oftentimes too when I think of the Holy Spirit. So thank you. That, that is just amazing stuff. I mean, each one of that is certainly... The Holy Spirit, um, and and just shows how rich and amazing the divine Spirit is, um, and, and that we've each touched and tasted, it, and we can never fully explain it. Thank goodness, but we can point to it. So, makes sense. What I'd like us to do next, if we if you're open to that, is just go into a, what I call Alexio Divina of life. <clears throat> um, and what I'll do is I'll invite us in in a few moments just to go into the quiet. Uh, to close our eyes, to center ourselves. I'll ring a chime when we're ready. Um, and what I'm going to do is read the uh, from Acts 2, just the, the, the short uh, passage of when all of the uh, disciples and apostles and Marys and, and everyone was in the upper room when the Holy, when the Pentecost came. So I'll read that. And then I'll guide us through a guided imagination um, with some, some questions, some images. And the idea being, I'll invite us with the Holy Spirit a, as our guide to help us experience what would it be like if we were in that room? And maybe we are in the room right now because there's infinity. So we'll kind of walk through that. Uh, before we begin, it was interesting because I, I looked up the word Pentecost. I thought, what in the heck does that mean? Um, and I didn't realize it, but it actually comes from the, the Hebrew word, um, and it's the, a festival. It's like, uh, you know, in the United States, we have Oktoberfest or Germany and throughout the world, it's at harvest. Well, apparently the, the Jewish tradition was that 50 days after the, the day of Passover, they would join together in this amazing feast to celebrate God's uh, blessing and, and the harvest, basically. So it's interesting to me how God uses ordinary events like water and wine and, you know, holidays, Jewish holidays, for example, to all of a sudden transform it into something bigger. So the Pentecost, it would have been normal that there would have been a ton of people in Jerusalem because they come to celebrate from all faiths and traditions. 
Um, and it would have been normal that the apostles and all of them you know, went into a room, obviously afraid, but also hoping that, that the spirit would uh, 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 appear to them. So I just thought it was an interesting, uh, the, the word Pentecost coming from the word 50, but also uh, how God used that feast and transformed it even deeper into what we in the Christian tradition now would call the first uh, aspect of the Holy Spirit coming. So if you want to take a moment and maybe get comfortable in your chair and <clears throat> maybe close your eyes and just let go of the day and just maybe feel your feet on the ground. Maybe focus on your breath. Make a couple of deep breaths just to center ourselves in the pneuma, the spirit, the wind of God breathing in and through us. And when I ring the chime, we'll begin. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Imagine for a moment that you are present there in the room with the others. Let your imagination just draw you into what the room looks like. Where are you in the room? Are you seated at a table with the others? Are you standing? observing? What does it feel like to be in that room, not knowing what the next step would be in Christ's journey of deepening his spirit, the promises that Christ made? And suddenly, what would it be like if you were sitting there and you heard the wind blow into the room all around you? Are the sounds of the wind within you like your breath? Or are they outside you in the room or both? Just feel the wind blowing against your skin, in your lungs. Just be present to the wind. Is there an emotion that rises up as you feel the wind blowing in and around you, against your skin, in the room. Imagine now you see the spirit's tongues of fire, a tongue of fire resting on you. Where is that tongue of fire in your imagination? Is it above your head? Does it flow into your heart space? Can you feel that spirit of love and fire within you? Does the spirit's tongue of fire have an energy 
a color. How do you imagine it? And what's it like to notice that that tongue of fire is upon everybody in the room? You and every single person gathered, waiting, hoping, praying. As that spirit has its way with you, in you, and in everyone in the room, what does that make you feel like? Is there an emotion you experience as you imagine the spirit's presence there with you, in you? Just let it embrace you on the inside, mind, body, and spirit, knowing you don't have to do anything but just be present to it. The spirit will blow within you as it needs to. That's called grace. Does the spirit offer any words to you, a word, a phrase, if anything? If not, that's fine too. Is there a word of wisdom, love, affirmation? What does the spirit say to you right now, present in this room? And when you're ready, slowly bring your awareness back to the room that you're sitting in. Feel the chair or the sofa that you're sitting on. Maybe take some cleansing breaths to just be aware of life and breath. And when you feel the nudge, feel free to open your eyes. So if anybody like to share what they experienced, what was that like? What did you notice? It was scary at first. Ah. And I was in a corner. I felt like I shouldn't be there. And I was just watching everyone else. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden when the wind came, again, it was scary. But there was a warmth to the wind. I mean, and you know, it was funny because I would know the picture of the, the tongues of fire on all the people. And it was funny because before you even said it, I saw all the tongues go on their heads and I'm going, is there one above mine? You know, and it's like, you want to ask somebody, do I have one too? But then it was just a calmness after that. And I, I, I don't know, you can feel it all the way from the top of your head to your toes. It mm. was just a warmth wow. and calmness. Mm. Wow. Wow. The Holy Spirit arrived <laughs> and moved you from that, that kind of, you know, scariness into that calmness, into that, that peace. Wow. The movement. And it, it was something you said what did he say and it was like i've been with you always 
Mm. And I'm with you now, mm. and I will be with you in the future. And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna write that one down. <laughs> yeah. See, I believe, and I imagine everyone else. I would I would suspect that is the Holy Spirit. I mean, the amazing thing in what was that ten minutes that we sat and just opened ourselves up to the Holy Spirit, and what Joyce just, I mean, that's her unique, her direct communication with the, the Spirit, and to me, that's. That's what God, like, he's going, yeah, yeah, that's what I want you, Joyce, to experience. And, and each one of us in our own unique way. So thank you, Joyce. That's, wow, brings tears to my eyes, tears of joy. <laughs> Anybody else? Amy? I was very surprised to find myself in the old, cha the chapel of the old Catholic Information Center on Ionia in Grand Rapids. Yeah. And that small space with the stained glass windows that were flowing water and all that water represented of baptism and life and spirit flow mm. and to be in that small space and hear that wind i was very frightened mm. it was i was very having lived through a tornado <laughs> I know what that sound is like, and but then when the flames came, there was peace. It was just mystical. It was um, calm. It felt safe. And I was looking around me at the community of everyone else with the flame and just feeling very connected to all of them and all that I knew about them and thinking about how the spirit was working in all of us. Wow, that's powerful. And those fruits of the spirit, you know, the calmness, the joy, the love and peace that, that the Corinthians talks about, that's certainly the, 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 the signs of the pre spirit's presence. So thank you, Amy, that's powerful. Wow. Anybody else wanna share what they experienced? Yeah, no. Um. Because I'm used to the silence and you were speaking. Yeah. Um, because, you know, because obviously silence and stillness go hand in hand. Sure. But the image that you were bringing to forth, um, I, I tried to block that out because mm -hmm. the way I, I, I do centering prayer and contemplation is that Cynthia talks about centering, putting the mind in the heart mm -hmm. and um, or dropping the mind down to the heart. And when... I was breathing deep from the heart space. I could actually feel the the sensation of the the warm wind or breath mm. circulating mm. and going out. Mm. So that effect is for me is all internal, mm. um, but that internal is actually the expansiveness of the spirit mm. affecting. Wow. the space around yeah. So yeah. This, yeah. peace and peace and calm it's stillness it's the only way i can describe it wow wow and and i'm assuming that was enough you know it's like yeah what more do we need yep. <laughs> yeah yeah and great. then with that you 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 can do that wherever you go in your day when you feel yourself going off center you just bring yourself to that stillness mm -hmm. yeah Beautiful. Thank you, Nella. Yeah. And good for you that you were able to, yeah, sometimes the words do get in the way, especially when we're trying to condense it into a, a short period of time. And good for you that you were able to just allow the spirit to kind of block out the words and let you have your own, you and the spirit have your own experience. So that's, that's, that's good. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Go ahead, Mary Jane. Yeah. Yeah. 
for me, um, I know I was seated at the table with some some of the other women who were there. I, I was kind of a little bit to the back, but close but close with them. And when the wind came, at first there was this fear, this scare, like what is this? And we all look, but then almost in, immediately it was it was as if the wind were simply being out side here and the wind a, a warm breeze is just blowing through my hair and um there was that sense of calm as as the others have said again that sense of you know what there's nothing to be afraid of it's it's this is okay and the tongues of fire that came initially upon the head then just it's almost like my whole body was on fire but i was not burned up and i did not feel any heat actually what i felt was actually freedom mm. there was the sense of being free from fear i felt free and what 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 came what i found myself doing and what i I felt happening in the room with all of us is singing that Negro spiritual. And I know I don't have much of a voice, but there's that freedom, freedom, freedom is coming. Oh, I believe freedom, freedom. I don't, it, you know, but there is a song like that, that it's a Negro uh, spiritual or the, the black African church. Um, and and it was just that um, kind of just joyful mm. sense of freedom mm. and that it was here, it was coming and it's here. Um, mm. Beautiful. And, and we were just, we were ready yeah. for, for whatever would come next, we were ready. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Freedom. I love that word and, and that song. Yeah. Yeah. All of that. Wow. And it reminded me as you were talking, you know, Moses in the burning bush, you know, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't consumed. It was on fire, but it was not consumed, which is clearly the Holy Spirit. There. Wow. How cool. Anybody else want to share? And don't feel like you have to. If, if you want to, that's fine. If, if you don't want to, that's okay too. I'll share. Um... I was sort of surprised the the space was I um, attended um, the living school of the uh, Roars um, Center for Contemplation. Um, and we would meet in um, Albuquerque in this hotel in this big, large room. It was just like a ballroom. and would meet for sessions and somehow this took me back there and it was as if the the doors these double doors that were all around the room just all blew open and mm -hmm. it was scary at first because it was really a powerful powerful wind with a lot of noise but it soon became something that just felt uh, it felt very powerful seeing these whatever these tongues of fire were on everyone and what they they did in me and it seemed like they did to everyone was just it was a warming of everyone's heart it was like the the mind and the heart joined together with this warmth and the striking feeling I had was one of oneness and connection with everyone in the room like you knew you could you were experiencing this incredible thing together. Um, and there was this, this feeling of connection. And the overwhelming feeling to, for me was hopefulness, just hopeful that the spirit is at work in powerful ways and that it's hopeful and that it's positive and it's good. Wow, wow. that's great. Uh... Thank you, Nancy. Anybody else before we move on? Yeah. And the beauty of it is, 
while that happened, what, 2000 years ago, it's, it happened again just now. And it's like, I mean, that's where I get excited. It's like, wow, this isn't just words. This isn't just, you know, history that we're reading. It's God is saying, this is incarnating itself in you and me in our own direct ways. We just experience, I have to believe, the, the divine spirit communicating with us. And all we, like some, one of you said is, we just open ourselves to it. We create the space and you know the wind and the fire and the emotions and all that and the wisdom, the words of wisdom. Um, and, and I, you know, again, I, the, the, uh, uh, Joyce, you know, one of the things that my spiritual director told me too, and you probably told you is when those words of wisdom come, I mean, I've got a little journal, I call it God conversations. And when some of that comes, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to write this down. And just to, to kind of reflect on that, you know, and come back to that basically. So, yeah. So thank you. That's um, you know the other interesting thing is that it is scary at first, as because it's something it's unknown to us, and so yeah, I think there is a sense of whoa. You know, I I don't know if you all all remember the nesty nesty plunge commercial where they fall back into the pool, and I often thought in my early days of spirituality, it's like that's what it felt like is just trusting that God is moving in me, and I need to do that trust thing. Um, but the more we trust, as we all just did in these few moments, the more we open our hearts to letting the spirit move, move through us. So, yeah. So thank you. Yeah. So I'd like to just kind of spend a few minutes with some background stuff, some meat and potatoes. Um, so one of the things, um, <laughs> there's an Italian theologian and monk, Joachim of Fiori. And what I, I think we're discovering um, in this age is some of these writings of people we've never heard from, you know, the Book of Thomas, uh, the Book of Mary Magdalene, I mean, it, you know, the things that never quite made it to the top of the theological giants, we're finding that they have huge pieces of wisdom. And so I stumbled across this it Italian theologian and monk, Joachim of Fiori, and um, he, some current theologians have said that he is probably the greatest um, apo apostolic. He, he was predicting how you know, kind of saw God in the larger vein of the of, of the medieval, basically. And what what Joachim says, and I did the, the handout. I, if you haven't gotten already, I can email it again to you with the recording, and I've got links in there so you can study a little bit more about this guy. But what what he said in short is he says, you know. God's deepest desire is to enter into an intimate relationship, in, intimate relationship with us individually first and also as a community. And God wants to guide us with divine wisdom so we can be happy and create more love in the world, incarnate God's love in the world. It's, you know, I, I think of it's what every good parent wants for their loved ones. And God being a divine parent, um, wouldn't God want us to be guided by, uh, uh, you know, God's spirit uh, with wisdom so we know where to go and what to do in life so we can be happy and love and serve others. So Joachim came up with this, this theory um, and um, he said basically that there are three, that if the Trinity is true in the Christian tradition, if the, there's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he says that God has chosen to reveal God's self through these three ages um, and that he, and, and we'll walk through each one of them, and, and nobody disputed what he was saying, but what he said, and I think that's what some uh, have, have, have kind of questioned his, uh, his, his writings and theology. What he said is God is moving so close to humanity that in the age of the spirit, we will have direct communication with God. And this is probably where he got himself into trouble. He says, we might not even no, we may, might not even no longer need the church, the institutional church. I think that's what probably got him a little bit of trouble. Maybe he went a little too far with that last piece. But, you know, it's interesting because many people that call themselves spiritual but not religious are having those direct communications with God, as we'll talk about, without an institution. And it's as real and relevant as, as those of us that choose to stay in our traditional. And so it's that both and of that. So, um, it's interesting that I, what I kind of laugh at is the, the stuff that kind of gets condemned a little bit ultimately comes to the top as, well, maybe there was some good wisdom in here and it shouldn't have been stifled. So if you want to read more about him, there, you, you, and, and, and in the um, Phil, Phyllis Tickle's book, 
the great emergence, she has a chapter about him too that talks about. So what are those three faces of the Trinity and why is it important? So if, if in fact God, I, I just kind of like to play around with, you know, if God was, you know, really was him and Jesus are talking to the Trinity, like, okay, how can we do this thing? We created humanity and, and how do we, you know, ex explain and how do we in a real way make ourselves intimate with these wonderful people that we've created over the ages? So the first thing, um, hypothetically, and, and, and uh, uh, Joachim would say, this is what happened is the age of the father. So in the early days, uh, the Jewish tradition, uh, initially God revealed God's self to humanity as God the father. God spoke directly to the prophets and other wise men and women. Um, and then they shared God's wisdom and guidance with the community. He gave us the Ten Commandments as universal truths to show us how to live in harmony with each other. So Moses gets the Ten Commandments. He takes them back to the people and say, here's the rules that, that God gave me to follow. Um, you know, the, the, the prophets would say, this is what God revealed to me. You know, and so God said, yeah, okay, let's do it that way. I'll, I'll talk to these wise men and women, and they'll go into the community and they'll explain what I'm trying to do. Well, that was a great idea. And, but us being human, we decided, well, let's follow a bunch of false gods and idols, basically. You know, we didn't listen to the father. We grumbled, we walked away and wandered aimlessly in the desert for how many years, For you know? So God goes, okay, that was a good idea. And it kind of worked, but hmm, those humans didn't quite get it fully. So God says, okay, uh, let's try another way to reveal myself. Um, so he says, let's see, what could we do? Well, the best thing I could do is I could send my, you know, my son in human form into the world. And I'm going to teach them by the way he lives and what, and, and, and what he does is really the law of love. So it, now we're not going to just follow all these rules and regulations, which those are okay, but we get so caught up in rules and regulations, we're not understanding the spirit of the law. So let's bring Jesus into the world and he will teach us that the law can be really condensed into love God, love yourself and others, the, the great commandment basically. And as, as Paul says about Jesus, Jesus went about doing good and God was with, was with him. So Jesus modeled perfect love and forgiveness. But again, us being humans, we didn't fully understand Jesus this way. We were threatened by the power of his love because as humans, we want to be in control. The, the, you know, the Romans want to be in control. The Jews want to be in control. Even I, I look at me, it's like my own personal life. I want to be in control. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, it, and it's letting go of that, recognizing that we're in, in combination with this divine spirit of, of Jesus um, teaching us the power of love. So what do we do? We said, you know what? We don't like what he's saying. We're going to lose our own personal power and community power. Uh, we decided we were in charge and we sentenced Jesus to death. Um, I don't know. I, I use the probably get in trouble here legally, but I use the the picture of Jesus from the Chosen, the series. I don't know if any of you have seen that, but it's an amazing uh, free series uh, that, that uh, 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 on the life of Christ that makes the Bible come to, to to life. If you're interested, and just Google that, and that that's the kind of the image of Jesus they use. So again, it doesn't quite work out <clears throat> for the age of the sun because, but even on the cross, you know, Jesus model perfect love. You can do anything to me. You can spit in my face, put a crown of thorns on me. You can torture me. And I, yeah, I'm going to be human where it's like, I'm going to struggle in the garden of Gethsemane. I'm not going to fully understand, but in the end, I'm going to say, father, forgive them. I mean, can you imagine <laughs> they know not what they're doing? And then what does he do into your hands? I commend my spirit. I mean, that's and to me, a foreshadowing of what God then decides to do is the age of the spirit. And so in the, being the ever patient and loving divine parent, God turns the other cheek <laughs> and sends the Holy Spirit. And the, and the creator has placed the spirit of love and wisdom directly in our hearts. And, and again, the metaphor for me is like an inner compass to guide and remind us that we are loved, that we can be guided and have that direct communication that uh, Joachim talked about, we can have direct communication with God um, as long as we learn what the language of God is, as we'll talk about, and learn to create the space to hear that language. And that is that direct communication with God that Fioria talked about. And I, I, I would imagine each one of us here today could say, that's probably the most life-giving piece. I mean, granted, going to church and worshiping and reading and 
But that direct communication with God through centering prayer or the different ways that we use, we'll talk about. I mean, to me, that changed everything uh, when that began to, to unfold in my life. And so it's that direct communication with God. That was, was what I was hungry for. And I remember Sister Nancy Brousseau said, you know, God wants you to experience God, not just think your way to God. Thinking's okay, but exactly as, as you said, no, God wants to connect your heart and your mind together through that direct communication. And that's what Fiora, uh, Jochum, he predicted that, that that's what God was doing in the age of the spirit. So now we have this one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. We seek the spirit that's seeking us. We come to know God's deepest desire is to love us and to guide us into wholeness and peace through the spirit's movement in our lives. Um, I, I like to use that spiritual antenna gets tuned to the radio frequency of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I love watching, I don't know if everybody's seen the 2000 movie Frequency, um, where the son, uh, the dad dies, and this, the son is using a ham radio of his dad's. And he discovers a radio frequency where he can communicate as he turns the dials, he can hear his dad through the, on the other side of, of eternity speak to him across time. And, and to me, that movie spoke to me. I, I don't know if they, they had, I think Dennis Quaid was in it, kind of spoke to me of, isn't that what we're doing? We're you know, turning the mm. frequency in AM and FM radio or whatever it is, the headset into, God, what are you saying to me on your ham radio that I'm connected to? Um, so I guess a question would be, with that as background, with what, what Joachim taught us, do you think that makes any sense that God revealed God's self first and, and, and does continue us to do it? It's not like, you know, linear, because even our own relationship with God is, is something we re recognize. You know, we have, I, I sometimes relate to God as father, God as spirit, God as son, da, 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 but to recognize as a universal, you know, movement of God's presence, do you think it's it's safe to say we're in the age of the spirit? Why or why not? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And isn't that, I mean, it makes me kind of, I mean, what does it make you feel like when you think, wow, this is the age of the spirit? Well, can, can I say something? Because yeah. um, church for me was actually a hindrance there's something in me that I was never satisfied in a church. I, I felt that they put God in a box, whereas with me it was saying I couldn't stay there anymore. It actually hindered me. Mm -hmm. So I left, and like I said, I had this incredible experience five years ago, and it's still ongoing. Mm -hmm. And everything that, that Cynthia, Richard, everything that was talked about, just for me, my life is my guide because... I didn't know any, I'm, I wasn't churched. I, I, I didn't understand the language of the spirit because it was all up here. It was a belief system here. Mm -hmm. And for me, I have had the spiritual experience now. This for me is God is, has pulled me out. He's said, you are open. I'm granting your desires of your heart. Mm -hmm. Now, when I look back at my whole life, the desire of my heart was St. Francis, I didn't know it, but when I read it, I knew it, make me an instrument of your peace. That has been my heart's desire all my life, and I didn't know it because I used to bag out the Catholic Church um, and its conservatism, um, but the Catholic Church does have the mystery, and that's what's brought me back. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, I'll resonate with any religion. I'm I won't call myself a Catholic or whatever. I've had the born again experience okay. um, through the Pentecostal church, but this one is like so defined. And it's, I had, I always have the experience. Then I read about, which tells me what's just actually happened to me. Mm -hmm. wow. And for me, I have experienced the, the sensations in the body. I, I get waves of sadness and suffering which if I didn't know what it was without this going through, I, I don't know, I'd be in the loony bin, I think. <laughs> yeah, sure. Because Martin Laird also, I started reading his books that helped me understand what that sadness is, the mm -hmm. heaviness around the heart. Um, and, and, and it's a vehicle of light. I know now it's a gift. Mm -hmm. It's God is just saying this suffering, it's not my suffering, it's the suffering of human, humanity. 
And he's just asking me to hold it and then let it go, to transform it into love. Because the energy field around us, and I'm going to talk about maybe physically here, metaphysics, Mm -hmm. um, because obviously it's a very metaphysical experience. You feel the energy around you and it's real. And if if you don't know or understand or have that sensation or that awareness, it can overwhelm you. Mm -hmm. It can actually, you know, make it project then onto your family members. Um, And this is, I suppose, the union of the the, the psyche, the human life and the spiritual life. Um, um, For me, I am so sensitive to this energy around me that now I know the difference between God is saying, you've got to transform it. You've got to help me transform it because we are the we are the instruments here on earth mm-hmm. to actually transform mm-hmm. some energy. Mm-hmm. You know, if someone's hurting and they come to you for help, you feel their pain, but somehow you God gives you the right words to say to that person because it's not me. I understand it's not me that's that's doing all this. God is just using my vehicle here on earth to manifest whatever needs to be healed in a person. And I don't go walking around saying you're healed in the name of Christ or any, you know, yeah. I can't, I'll be really in the loony bin, <laughs> you know, but I do it in a way that God speaks my language, which will be very unique to my life circumstances, to my culture, to my community. Um, so I think f- for me, it's all about the inner sensation. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Like God is intimate with, with that, and it's for me, it was the the, the suffering of the heart space. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then obviously, Cynthia Burjo talks about the liminal area, you know, of of the universe and the heart and the suffering, all of that. Because I've got all the books, and I've, yeah. I I don't know, I'd be in the loony bin if it wasn't for these books. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it, yeah. And that's that's that wisdom that's you know through 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 the reading and all that. And, and the only way I it, that's just my that energy to me is the divine energy of love. Teilhard talks about that God is the divine energy of love. And his whole theory is that, you know, when the big bang occurred, God was spirit. And prior to then, and God says, I want to put my spirit of love into matter and boom, you know, every piece of us or every one of us has that, that small spark of divine love and the energy then that's just how I can, can understand it is the divine energy of love that then, becomes a vehicle, exactly as you said, Nella, that, that God uses, just like Jesus did. He prayed to the Father to be the healing presence. You know, God healed through him. So so the exciting thing is, and I don't think we've woken up to that. I mean, I don't think we've woken up to, and I think we can, this is the age of the spirit. I think we can begin to, okay, if it is, uh, what's the spirit up to? And so I just kind of going back to what 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 uh, Phyllis Tickle teaches in, in, through her Great Emergence book and John Sweeney's The Age of the Spirit. You know, we can say we have been through not as bad as the Passion of Christ, but we all have to admit the last century has been, particularly the last couple of years of the pandemic, has been unprecedented. Political upheaval, crisis after crisis. You know, everybody's fighting, you know, my blog, I put all the stuff in there about, my God, everyone's fighting for power, basically. And, you know, um, and it was interesting to me as I was putting this together, I thought to myself, well, how did in the, in the movie, The Passion of Christ, in the midst of all this turmoil that Jesus was experiencing, both in the world <laughs> that, that's, you know, killing him, but also him individually, he turns to his mother, Mary, and says, See, I make all things new. And, and that moment, and, and, and I think it was the spirit as I put this together, was like, wow, that's kind of a strange thing to say while well, you're carrying this cross and you're you know, the most beaten person probably in history. But he knew the spirit in him allowed him to say, you may not understand it, but I am making all things new. And Mary point I probably had to trust that there was an unrevealed truth but that she could eventually begin to understand what he meant as everything unfolded and and I wonder if 
in this period of, you know, it's the both end of it's the worst of times. And I hate to say it, well, I shouldn't. Yeah, it is the best of times because if God is making all things new, that to me, I, I can plug into that. And so then it becomes, okay, what's Christ making new? And we got to go back and, and, and look at some of our, our teachers, uh, like John Sweeney and, and Phyllis Tickle and others. Um, and I, it seems to me historically, this is that 500 year pattern, basically. So the, those teachers have gone, and, and I, I talk about you know, Rohr uses that order, disorder, and reorder is the path of renewal and transformation. So if that, just like the four seasons, or how, you know, nature uh, dies and resurrects again and renews itself, and God uses that, and the death and, and, and passion and, and resurrection and Pentecost is the order, disorder, reorder, how universally has God been doing that? So um, basically, you know, uh, they would point back to the first would be the great transformation 2000 years ago. The disorder is the Roman Empire is using power to con corrupt, control, imprison dissidents, um, rape, pillage and do everything horrible. The Jewish faith, you know, they're at odds with each other. You know, they're, some are, let's follow the rules and let's go kill the Romans. Other ones are saying the Sadducees. And, and what a mess, basically. And then some are saying, no, you got to follow the rules and regulations. And there are 500,000 rules and regulations. And, oh, I, I ate meat on the Sabbath or whatever it is, you know. And so it's like, okay, that's a disorder back when Jesus came. But what's the reorder is the time of Christ the great transformation God gives us, Emmanuel, God with us, to create a new understanding of our relationship with God. God as Son revealed to us divine love, and we are connected to divine love. We are part of God's divine love as one. So there's the great transformation, the disorder and the reorder. Phyllis would say that it takes 150 years <laughs> for the reorder to take place. So I, I don't know exactly where we are in our own <laughs> reorder, but uh, it does take time, it appears. So then we go into the Dark Ages um, in the four, 476 to 1000 AD after the death of Christ. Disorder, you know, the Roman Empire collapses, going to the Dark Ages, you know, learning is stopped. It's horrible. Europe is suffering. Uh, the reorder, though, in this period, the church entered a, a, an era of preservation and went underground. And there we have monks and nuns practicing the monastic tradition, abbeys, convents, and pri prior, pri priories. Um, that whole contemplative tradition that Benedict and the, and the Abbas and the Mamas, you know, they took back in, from the desert. We see this whole contemplative tradition now growing um, in, in the midst of the, the, the Dark Ages. Um, the next would be the Great Schism, as, as one of you mentioned. I, I think, uh, uh, Amy, you, you mentioned that around 1054, at the beginning of the new, new millennium, um, you know, the Christian church split. The Eastern and Western branches uh, basically had a disagreement. I don't fully understand it, but something about the creed, and, and Phyllis goes into it in great detail in, in, uh, in her book, uh, The Age of the, uh, of the Spirit. Um, but we still see that split between the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches, a disorder. But the reorder is the Eastern traditions of meditation, contemplation, that reverence, that deep icon that I went once to with a buddy of mine to a, a funeral for, in a Russian Orthodox church. And oh my God, the symbolism and the, the piety and the beauty of, of, of the honoring God and worshiping, um, you know, that, that continued. And, and we're beginning to pull that back into our own tradition, the meditation, the contemplation um, that we really threw out with the enlightenment. I think therefore I am, which is actually quite frankly, now in this century, we're struggling with this thinking thing that is much, it is not I am, it's driving me nuts basically, you know? And so, and the efforts at reuniting the Eastern church or the Western church, I mean, they've made great strides. There's ways to go, but you know, there's been a huge sense of ecumenicism that's happening. Then the Re Reformation comes, as, as one of you mentioned, you know, Luther posts this abuses of the Catholic Church on the door, and they're real, you know, the church was messed up, power went to their heads as an institution, chaos in the church and society reigns, what comes out of that is the reorder, um, new branches of Christian tradition with different understandings of how people relate to God personally, through direct prayer and individual interpretation of the Bible, um, so there's a Reformation, a new, you know, the Spirit uses uh, the Reformation even to, to spread the, the, the roots of, of Christian tradition even deeper. 
unfortunately, you know, again, we do excesses now and it's, you know, sometimes the Bible's the only thing and there's no room for the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, that's kind of the great part of the great transformation. So the great transformation would be this century that we're in. Um, and to be aware of that, you know, the disorder, pandemic, wars, insurrection, economic problems, police and minorities under attack, you know, the church is bleeding with scandal I and mean, politicians proclaim moral high ground, but they're just, just using that to manipulate people many times. They're not speaking from wisdom. Uh, the biased media is dividing us. Culture wars are rampant. Schools are used for social reengineering. Special sports and uh, Hollywood have abandoned entertainment for the gods of political correctness. Why? Particularly so that people can come and buy their products. And, and so we got everybody's jockeying for power, basically. That's the disorder. <clears throat> and if we continue to look for those to save us, as we'll talk about, it's not going to save us. Um, and, and that might be one of the things we, we, we're, we're learning in this generation. So for me, I, I think about what are some of the signs of the reorder? Well, post-enlightenment and post-modernism, people are looking to move beyond an intellectual encounter with God, as, as, as now that you, you know, said so, so, so clearly. We're seeking a relationship with God that includes the heart, something that allows us to experience God directly, that moves us emotionally and brings the head and the heart together. We don't throw the head out, <laughs> but it's not the, I think, therefore I am. It's, no, there's, uh, there's mind, body, it's and- I am, therefore I, I think. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. So one of the signs to me of reorder is that we want to experience God, not just intellectualize God. Obviously, the world is connected. I mean, there's Nella in Australia and all across the United States. You know, through the Midwest and 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 beyond, we're all together uh, through internet and technology. Science and religion, I, I think, have really begun to interrelate and inform each other. They haven't become these enemies anymore. It's like, oh, they both have something to say. And you know, you know, wonderful people like Ilya Delio and Teilhard and Chardin, these scientists are mm. speaking into spirituality and help us understand at a deeper level. Spiritual but not religion is on the rise. Some people say that is bad, but I, a recent study that I was reading says 80%, 80 to 95 people in, at least in the United States would say that they are spiritual um, at least. And now that doesn't mean they're religious. And that's another thing. And, and actually religious institutions are on the decline, uh, which may say they may have to change or whatever. But, um, but the fact that people are spiritual and still claim that is, is a sign of hope to me of re reorder. Meditation and contemplation from the East. I mean, my God, we have just uh, you know, that has been transformative, I think, for all of us, I, I would say, and it's taking root, and we're teaching it to each other, and to our children, and to uh, each other, and we're not throwing the baby, the baby out with the bathwater, if, you know, it, you know, if the, it, it's a whole thing of um, uh, Wilbur, Ken Wilbur says, you know, we transcend and include, it doesn't mean that we have to throw out traditional religion, if, if people mm -hmm. choose, as, as I've chosen to stay Roman Catholic, I love the church, I, I, you know, certainly there's abuses in it. I love worship. I love the sacraments. I love the Eucharist, but it's not enough for me. I need that direct communication with God and, and to go beyond the church. So we're staying grounded in tradition, um, orthodoxy, but also allowing the spirit uh, to transform shape and reshape how we relate to God. We're recognizing God is a verb, not a noun, and that we are called to incarnate Christ. And the faith traditions are making huge strides and shaking hands and learning from each other. It's not like I got the country club and you got to get into my club or you're going to hell. I mean, it was, I think the Vatican too for our Catholic church to say, you know, to go so far as to say that all traditions have pieces of the truth was a huge thing. And I think it's opened us up to say it's, there's not just not one size fits all based on So those would be things that I would see um, just my own thoughts of, 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 of how I kind of perceive where the reorder is taking place. What, what, um, what would you say? Are there other things that you, you would say, you know, I would point to this both individually or, you know, universally that, that the spirit is up to that gives you hope that you can say, yes, I see God is making all things new, uh, where reorder is taking place spiritually. Sorry, I've got to apologize because I don't want to sabotage this meeting, but I just want to give you some context. I have been doing this, just me and God. I have, I, ha I can't connect with any group that understands what I've gone through. Sure. So now that I've found this group, 
through the Facebook page, I speak because I haven't had an outlet to speak. Sure. Because what God has given me sometimes is a burden because there's so much that he gives you so much, but it's in the amount that you give out. And it's it's a burden sometimes because there's so much that he gives me and I haven't got this. It's all energy and I haven't got this outlet to speak. So now I finally connected with a group that is talking my language. <laughs> Right, exactly. All we're here Friday. in Australia. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. There's a so, sign of the spirit right there. The, the, the that's spirit. right. So I, I have to apologize if I'm talking too much, but there is so much inspiration and enthusiasm and um, he's, he's speaking my language that that is a sign that something powerful is happening, happening in, in the spirit. And um it's that awakening. It, there's an awakening. It is. It is. And what it is, I really truly believe that this is the second coming of Christ, is that when every single person has this understanding, it's this, the, it's it's not who you think you are. There's, there's, there's two seeds or two currents mm -hmm. where this spiritual being having a human experience. And, and until we um, understand what what is in matter what forms in matter is in spirit mm -hmm. so as as on earth as in heaven sure. and we have to loose it here on earth to loose it in heaven yeah so that is the the, the power and we i don't really not really I, I really truly believe we don't realize especially christians mm -hmm. realize the power that we have yeah yeah mm -hmm everyone has will have their own unique key that will unleash that power yeah. it's that and power of love the power of the holy spirit yeah that's yeah. it and it's the unity of god the father god the son god the holy spirit which is the manifest form of the human identity saying i'll use me as an example nella born in port kembla blah 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 my story has to be united with my soul essence and I suppose this is where Gurdjieff teaching comes in, the essence of who we are, because this is what's in conflict. A lot of people think they are their identity. And, and this is what happens when you're dying. If you don't get it now, you'll get it later when you're dying. That's when the soul has a chance to actually transform and manifest. And then it's too hard to do it at the back end of life. Exactly. Yeah, I hear you. To face yourself who you thought you were or your life to realize that you were something else <laughs> underneath this form. Yeah. Let me just, um, and I, I appreciate that now. I mean, that, that, what you just said and, and the enthusiasm, the passion, it, that is a sign to me of the awakening that Richard Hauser talks about, the awakening to the spirit that is happening to you and that fire that goes on to other people and that you talk to it and that we're experiencing, you know, in our own ways, that, you know, here basically. So it, it, my cut at, um, you know, where, what's the spirit up to? It seems to me, the spirit is telling us in this century, hey, people, wake up. This is the age of the spirit. You need to claim it. You need to claim it. And, and, and once you do that, you'll begin to open your hearts to the spirit. I think also God is inviting us to seek silence. This world is so noisy. It's, it's, it's crazy. And you know, if language, the language of God is silence, as Mother Teresa says, the, the noise of the world is drawing us to find different ways, meditation, centering prayer, uh, mindfulness, whatever, to experience that quiet space. So God's inviting each one of us to seek, if possible, um, daily silence, you know, 15, 20 minutes or more, basically. Merton and Thomas Keating, I think, have reintroduced, reintroduced us in the Western culture in, as evidence that God invites us to quell the noise of the world with that regular practice of daily time to be still and listen. To me, the, the pandemic is the great pause, a horrible thing, again, a disorder, but also I recognize it drew people to go back home. My kids are reassessing their own priorities as work. I mean, they're still working, obviously, but boy, maybe I can work at home and also be present to the kids. People are at home, they're praying more. Um, they're going to the home of, of our hearts. We're, we're going back and recognizing you know, life is, is short and the suffering is inviting us to reassess our priorities. I also believe the universal church is unfolding. The mere fact that we're sitting here, you know, six, seven of us across the, the globe 
um, it, it, you know, God is using the internet and, and even in the midst of the pandemic, you know, the churches went, went universal. And um, the fact that we can talk and share our experiences, I think again, is signs that the, 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 the spirit is at, at, at work. I think this is just for me, and I think is that false gods cannot save us. I, I, I just feel like we are back into, you know, I've got the truth, you've got the truth, I'm gonna beat you up with my truth, shut up, cancel culture, da da da. I don't wanna get political at all, but everybody is claiming we've got the truth and nobody's listening basically. And to me, I think Nella, you said it, is if we seek the divine, if we seek the spirit's wisdom and guidance, God will lead us out of this desert time. Mm -hmm. If we don't seek individually and as a community, the spirit's guidance, whatever form of faith tradition you, you is part of it, we're going to be wandering in the desert 500 years from now. I mean, I often think to myself, can you imagine if every person in the world spent 20 minutes in, in the quiet every day, you know, if our politicians, of our, 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 you know, everybody in the world, um, you know, spent that 20 minutes just to listen to whatever the divine spirit is for wisdom, the world would be transformed. And I think the last thing is we're recognizing we are co-creators with God. We have a responsibility mm -hmm. and God has given each one of us certain gifts and um, we can't hide them under a bushel basket. We can't beat other people up with them, obviously, but uh, we, we are co-creators with God. And if we co-create with God, and allow God to incarnate us that that be the as Saint Francis says and Nellis said you know we are the instruments the vessels of God's peace so those would be my cut at it um, can I just say something sure yeah I just remember Mary Jane said she can't wait to see Jesus as <laughs> Jesus Christ and I wanted so much to say I think what we need right now is to look at each other and yeah. see Christ in us mm -hmm. and then I think mm -hmm. I you know that's that's the Holy Spirit working in all of us that we can believe that mm. where his hands, his feet, his eyes, yeah. his heart. Yeah. Joyce, and, I, I think that's wisdom. I think you're exactly right. That's what, yeah, yeah. We are the body of Christ. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Amy. Just have one quick comment. I am very encouraged um, with changes that I see. I believe that we are God's children created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Mm -hmm. And I sought out the most inclusive church that I could find. And what I saw shortly before the pandemic were all of these young families coming in with children. I have not, I'm 78. I have never seen anything like it. And I think that part of what is happening is these parents want their children to see inclusion of women, inclusion of uh, transgender or gay people or um, different races. And there are a number of different races within my church community. And I, I just, I this is my feeling from what the spirit speaks to me is that this is the way that the world is going, not to break people up into sections, but to bring us to more inclusive love in, in Christ Jesus. So yeah. that's my place. Yeah. Vicki just, she said it had, had to go, but she did a, a little um, text message. I do think we find God in silence. Then we need to live that wisdom and find community. Um, I think that's exactly, she's sorry she has to go, but uh, she really appreciates it. So I want to be respectful of our time. Why don't we go around um, and just take just a minute or two and, and, and how do you personally, what's your spiritual practice um, that you find life-giving in it? Just a, a, a minute or two uh, that connects you with the spirit. What do you do as a spiritual practice that allows you to connect regularly? Just like I said, just take a minute or two. What is the spiritual practice that is life giving for you? So for me, it truly is silence. Um, in fact, I met a woman today whose actual name is Silence. 
Oh. And I said, I love your name and I love silence. Um, I have been drawn to it. And so for me, my spiritual practice is definitely <clears throat> being silent, but not just externally, it is bringing that all of me to that silence. Mm. And I feel like <clears throat> for me personally, and probably for a lot of people, the, the thoughts running around our head or is I, I don't know if it was Thich Nhat Hanh or someone talked about the monkey mind, yeah. but we do so much with yeah. our, our yeah. thoughts. Um, and so for me, centering prayer is certainly a key um, practice for me or just the quiet walks that I can take here um, at any time of the year in safety, knowing I'm this small village, just um, and, and just being in nature, being present. Um, but silence um, definitely, as, as it was said, is the first language of God. And I think it was Thomas Keating who said that every other trans, everything else is a poor translation. Mm -hmm. okay. And so um, we are drawn. Yeah. I, I think in this age, we are drawn to, to mm -hmm. that silence. And that is my practice. And I pray for, for our world and our country to find, as you said, we could all just still ourselves that stillness and that quiet would make such a difference in our world. And I do know also that it's in the slowness of time that things happen and the spirit moves. And sometimes the spirit moves very slowly, oh, exactly. one person at a time. Yeah. That patient thing, huh? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks Mary Jane. Somebody else in a couple of minutes, what's, what's the spiritual practice that you find life giving to connect you with the spirit? Amy? quickly and then I need to leave but I am just I'm 78 years old and through my life I have been in different places right now I am aware all the time that God is present I don't mean like in the way if I were to sit quietly in silence and open up I'm just aware but silence is really important to me too. I was sitting in my room this morning praying with my eyes shut and my husband opened the door and he said, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, I'm praying. And he said, what's the issue? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, where do you want to start? But um, it wasn't about an issue. It was about being with someone that I love. So yeah that's awesome yeah it's kind of like i know my husband loves me even if he's not around so i'm kind of aware of him <laughs> yeah so yeah. i'm gonna go join him now yeah. nice meeting everybody there is a facebook page there is a facebook page for this group not for this group there's uh so, so there, there's a century prayer group i have a facebook page um, for myself, for simple wisdom. I, 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 I shoot that link out when. All right, thanks. Gotta go. Bye bye. Nice yeah. to see everybody. You too. So just take a moment and Nella and Joyce, what's your practice for you? Well, a few years ago, I did the Ignatius, Lord, teach me how to pray. Mm. So I've been, you know, it's been, it was easy during the pandemic because there was lots of free time. Yeah. But, you know, as we start to get, you know, out again. I, I kind of, I haven't let it go. No, I have a little prayer book that I try to sit for like 15 minutes in the morning and you know, yeah. center myself. And, and, you know, some days I read the little prayer and it means nothing. Other days it's like, oh, <laughs> how do you know I was thinking that, you know? And some days I'll just talk. And, yeah. You know, it, it's, he hears me, but, you know, and I'm sure people think I'm nuts <laughs> talking to myself. But. <laughs> We, we, we relate. <laughs> you're in good company that we all know what you're talking about. Good deal. Nella, what's your practice? Is it centering prayer, is it? Uh, yes, yeah, contemplation, centering prayer. Um, I suppose I was drawn to it because even though I, would, I sort of was raised in, oh, well, not raised, but I was in a Pentecostal movement, I always thought prayer was about words. 
And I used to marvel how these people used to just pray with all these beautiful words and I could never do that. But I'd, I'd try and make that time for God. Um, and all I could do was try to open my mouth and it was like I was muted. I could not say a word because it was like the feeling of my heart the words just came poured out of my heart. Mm. But I dismissed that because I thought I'm a very good talker anyway. Um, <laughs> and that's why I thought when I got to prayer, I couldn't speak. It was like I, I got it and I couldn't speak. And so I dismissed that. And then obviously what happened to me five years ago in that really deep, dark place, it was like I felt comfortable with just letting my heart sp speak. So I sat in the silence. So I was sort of drawn to it um, um, organically and naturally. And in that space, that's when the release came and the silence. I've been drawn to silence ever since then and realised that silence is God's language. Yeah. So um, for me now, I'm drawn to that interior silence and it follows me. It's like I'm in this bubble of silence and wherever I go, it follows me. So I don't come from that place of reaction. It's more yeah. of a space. Yeah. It's a gap. Wow. It's a deep, deep repose. Yeah. Um, that's the only way I can describe it. And yeah. it's harmony. Yeah. It's not my will, but your will be done. Mm -hmm. yeah. In just the last uh, five, 10 minutes that we have, one of the, my, my pathway, and, I, and there's many pathways, and, and I think that's the beauty of it is, is we understand, you know, not everybody has to take, I, I love what Richard Rohr says, not everybody wants to sit on a meditation cushion. My wife doesn't like sitting on a meditation cushion. She loves to walk in nature, and that's her experience of God. But as I studied uh, through the living school, through Cynthia, through my own spiritual direction from, from clients and, and my own spiritual director, I really looked at the, the, the spiritual giants, Benedict, Francis, Julian of Norwich, Teresa, Jesus, and others, and, and other faith traditions, Muhammad and, and uh, Gandhi. And what I really saw was four common lifestyle practices that shaped their lives. And those are really, I, I have to say, I, I, certainly they're, they're part of my um, trying to be open to and, and aware of the spirit. So the first is certainly that solitude and, and silence. What I saw was the, the spiritual giants, they took daily time for solitude, to be alone with God, to meditate and listen for the whisper of the Holy Spirit in whatever way was relevant for them. But that to me is probably the most important piece for all of us, my, my sense would be, as I look at these spiritual giants. The other spiritual reading, you know, reading the writings of spiritual masters, we've all referred to different teachers that, that we've read and, and it could be from scripture, could be from uh, other spiritual writers, but always having a book that we're chewing on. And if we don't recognize, oh, I need to pick up a new book or looking for God nudges when God says, oh, here's the book, you know, just kind of appears basically. The other's community, you know, Nell, as you said, I mean, yeah, I mean, when I, as I went through my transformation, my wife still thinks I'm nuts and, and, and I'm joking, but you know, it, not everybody understands. I think there is, when Christ talks about the remnant or the Old Testament talk, it's okay to say in some way we are the remnant. Um, and, and so not everybody's going to get it. And it's not our job to transform everybody. It's just to be a, a bubble, uh, you know, in, in the world that, that God has placed us in. So, but that community is so important with uh, these workshops we're doing. Spiritual direction for me is, uh, you know, being in spiritual direction with, with Don, my spiritual director, um, you, you know, having a spiritual friend, my wife and kids. So, making sure my community is with people inspiring me to grow and learning to push out people in a loving way who don't encourage me to grow that are really, you know, I, I still love them, but they're not in my inner circle of trust. And finally taking a, a spiritual gifts inventory um, to discover what are your spiritual gifts and then, and then discerning through prayer, how am I being called in this phase of my life to use them? And that's like on my website, I, I have a free spiritual gifts inventory because that was so transformative to me in, you know, 62 years of Catholic uh, training and education. I don't think anybody introduced me to a spiritual gifts inventory until I was in my thirties and I stumbled across it. So those are the four pieces that I, I got to just placed on my heart to kind of continue to teach. And, and again, it's, it's one pathway. It's not for everybody, but I can kind of look at that in my own life and encourage others 
you know, do you have a balance of those four things in your life? And when they are balanced, or then we experience uh, that deeper connection to the Holy Spirit. If one of them isn't balanced, then we seek out. So if community is not balanced, yeah, we seek out community. Um, if I'm not reading something and I'm all re- watching too much news, oh, I better pick up a book and turn the, the news off. So that's just kind of a my, my pathway as those. And, and I just, again, I'm writing this book that'll come out from Paulus Press at the end of this year, first part of next year, called Finding Flow. And, that, and that's just kind of my thing. But um, and I just, like I said, I just kind of feel God has pushed it on my heart to, okay, use that to throw it out to the universe and see if it works for people. So in the last few minutes, if I, if you had to look at your, you, you have a spiritual backpack um, and you had to, in a word or a phrase, what's the wisdom that you will take home tonight? What would you, I often imagine that we you know, there's a big bread basket here. We all put pieces of bread in with what we say and our experiences and what we're learning. And then we also take a piece of bread out of the basket, that, that, that dough, yeast and dough. So what would be the, the piece of bread, the piece of wisdom that you sense? This is the word, the phrase that God has placed upon my heart that I'll take home with me. For me, it would be hope. Um, um, yeah, I watch too much news. I, I, I learned to turn it off. The world outside and around me scares me. Um, I don't think anybody has the answers out there one way or another. I think we're working on it in different ways. Um, and, and I get scared for my kids and my grandkids. Um, and I know that what I find is hope that the Holy Spirit is, is alive. And, and once we, in our own way, connect with that spirit, um, I find hope. And it I, and I also allows me to let go. It's not my job to change the universe. It's my mm. job first to change me and keep working on me and my connection with mm. the spirit um, and let God <laughs> use me mm. whatever way. Yeah, so hope would be my word. Mm. See, my thing was that I don't think we're in the age of the spirit. I, I'm probably the only one in this group that thinks that, but I think there were people after the last pandemic that said, nothing's going to be the same. We're all, everybody's changing. Mm. And, you know, it's just, we're all on a journey and we just happen to find each other at this time. <laughs> but I'm sure there were seven people I mean, they didn't go over to Zoom. I mean, you know, and they maybe it was it wasn't maybe global, but you know, like you said, you you tend to be around the people that think like you do, that are in your bubble, mm-hmm. or you tend to finally have the wisdom to know that some people can be nice and you can like them or love them or whatever, but they don't believe like you do. You know, and, yeah. and it's not you're getting rid of them and you can't convince them, but it's just having the reinforcement. That... Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Mary Jane and Nella, what's the piece of wisdom? For me, oh. um, in oh. this is that there is definitely a benevolent force in the universe that is basically uh, way ahead of us. Okay. We just fall in whether we're for it or against. And if it's like water, if your water goes everywhere, it, it can go to the deepest crevices, it can go around big boulders. So if you're if the spirit can be like water and you feel that, you are actually helping create the the in the next stage of the evolution of this world. And my bent is definitely you know um Ilia Delio that there is something much bigger than us, but we are called to do our part. Everyone has to do their part. Mm-hmm. Um, and if it's not in life, it's at the end of life, we are transformed from matter to spirit and we just go back around and do it again. And <laughs> so 
it's it's definitely um, one one step forward and ten back. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, God is the one that's drawing the people that are sensitive to His voice. Mm -hmm. So, and like you said, we can take our hands off the control and just open our hearts, feel compassion for people because it all is it is about compassion and seeing the light of Christ in everyone, regardless mm -hmm. of their background, their cultural, what they look like, what they believe. Even the people that do the, the, the most evil things, there's still the God seed in them. Yeah, true. Yeah. That's compassion. Yeah, Nella, yeah, I like that compassion. Yeah, for sure. Mary Jane? Um, for me, um, what am I putting into my spiritual backpack? actually over the uh, the last mm, month or maybe longer it's the um it's from uh isaiah <clears throat> i believe it's isaiah 30 uh that where isaiah says that it is in waiting and in calm uh that you will be saved uh it is in quiet and with trust that your strength lies and um I just, you know, the waiting is very important. The waiting without um, without too much thinking about it. Yeah. Um, but just the waiting and being calm and trusting. Um, I think that's that's what we need to do. That's where God is calling us. Um, at least calling me right now mm -hmm. on my personal path. Um, and, um, and, and that ultimately, um, the God we believe in, however we choose to call that God, whatever force we believe, uh, animates this universe is in charge mm -hmm. and it is a force of love. It's mm -hmm. a force of goodness. And, um, I believe that I know that there are. In fact, I just had a conversation with my sister who really struggles to believe that, wishes she could believe what I believe. Um, and so there are many who still haven't come to know that relationship with God or love in the same way. Um, so, you know, I, it's very important it's very truthful. I, I accept very clearly, as you said earlier, wrote earlier, that we can't, you know, that, that there is a God who is in charge and we can communicate with this God. Mm -hmm. And I do. Yeah. Amen. I, I, yeah. I just, I, I, I wish everyone was at that place. I, but little by little, I think it, you know, what you're doing, Brian, uh, what, what any one of us does in any given day, whether it be a smile or just a, yeah. the way we communicate with another person is moving, you know, it's like, for me, it's that, it's that last snowflake that will eventually come on the branch and will all the snow will fall and all will be revealed. Uh, the, the tree will stand or the hundredth monkey or however it is that there is that point where it will happen. Yeah, yeah. And it's happening as you say, yeah, yeah. It's unfolding. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you all for an amazing evening, amazing conversation and uh, yeah, enjoy and, and ponder and enjoy the silence. I thought, Maybe we could together say this closing prayer, kind of a prayer to the Holy Spirit. So we want to just say it together, each line slowly. How about we do that? And then we can go from there. So let's take a moment and just take a deep breath and feel that wind of the Spirit, that fire of God's love and Spirit within us and invite it in even deeper. Come, Come Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit. Spirit. Fill, fill our hearts with the fire, fire of your unconditional, unconditional love. love. Send, send forth your Spirit, Spirit. and 
and form us with, with your divine artist's hand. Renew, Renew the face of the earth with your, with your divine guidance. Teach us, Teach us wisdom. wisdom. Help, Help us hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit. Help us to listen, to discern, and, and understand, understand where, where and how, and how you are guiding, are guiding us. us. Give, Give us the grace, grace to follow the path, path you are unfolding for us, for us and for and all the world. world. So, so that through us and with us, and with us you, you shall continue, continue to make all things new. In all holy name, holy name, God, name, we pray. God, we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, well, thank you, everyone, for what a wonderful evening of how enriching to be community. You know, yeah, all on the path together. So. Have a great evening and uh, continue with your amazing spiritual journeys as we are the light of the world. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. Appreciate it. Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank right. you. God bless. Good Bye. to see you all. Uh -huh.